than, even more than we think as we look at this. Uh, he wasn't associated with the Southern Baptist or the Baptist or any of those. He is the baptizer. That's a, a better way of identifying him. And it was 400 years since Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet that spoke to the people of God. 400 years later, here comes John. And John now is declared a prophet. It, he says, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah. Now, what's interesting in these verses that I read to you, it mentions seven people. Five of these people are political. Two of these people are religious. And what's interesting is John is neither. <laughs> he is really non-denomination. He's neither. Uh, five of them are politically correct. Two of them are religiously correct. Again, John is neither. <laughs> And John is a unique dude. He is different. He's different from anything these people have ever seen or anything we have ever seen. John was different. John was unique. So I want us to get kind of a, a, a mental image of John. And Matthew gives us some interesting things about him. So let me read this to you. In Matthew 3 verse 4 it says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair. That's different. And he had a leather belt, big old leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. And people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Not just the, the you know, Judea side of the Jordan, but on the other side of all around. People were coming to this phenomenal character. <laughs> now, John came in the spirit of Elijah. If you were going to relate to him, it would be the old prophet uh, in, in the Old Testament, Elijah the prophet. And this is what he's coming in. <laughs> and he wore a superhero outfit. And he evidently had a superhero diet. Uh, bugs dipped in honey. <laughs> and he lived in the woods. He didn't come from politics. He didn't come from religion. He came from the desert, which is God's way of telling us, this guy's different. And his message was tough. He was intense. He was confident. He had a message of take it or leave it. And it was a message of repent. I mean, just looking at the guy, his pulpit was the Jordan River. And just looking at the guy would make you repent, right? <laughs> repent! Repent! <laughs> but people came to this phenomenal character by the crowds of King James Version says multitudes. He was a phenomenal dude. Now, let's look at his message. And this is the first part that I want to talk to you about today is his message. Luke 3, 3. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching. Now, watch. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now leave that up there. I want us to take a good long look at this verse. Uh, how did John say to acquire, while that's up there, how did John say to acquire forgiveness for sins? Here's what, here's what I need, need you to see. Uh, and to what did John say you needed to be baptized into? If, if I baptize you, the baptism of water... What, into what am I baptizing you? Well, yeah, but what's the substance? What's the, what am, water, right? Okay. If I'm baptizing, or if you're re receiving a baptism of the Holy Spirit, into what are you being baptized? Water. Holy Spirit, right? Okay. Well, that's good too. But here's my point. What John says that you must be baptized into for the forgiveness of sins is what? Repentance. That's different. What does that mean? What is that talking about? If I want to be forgiveness for forgiven for my sins, is it a sinner's prayer? Is it coming to the altars and crying, saying I'm sorry? Coming to church on Sunday? Let's look at this word repent, because repent has gotten this church ease thought behind it. It's a very negative thought. Um, 
Uh, you seldom, at least I have recently, seldom heard a preacher really talk about repentance. In our charismatic world, we, 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 we capitalize on the grace, but, but you know, we, we don't talk about repentance. Now, Judy said that's not accurate, that I don't listen to enough television preachers because, <laughs> because it's gotten to be a pretty popular thought. And uh, I guess she's right because I haven't heard one talk about repentance and I don't know when. So let's look at this Greek word to start with. It's metanoia. And what it means is a change of mind which brings about a change of direction. A change of mind which brings about a change of direction. And then if I were to carry this on, it's, it's missing the mark. You're shooting at a target, but you're off the mark. It, it means change your mind and how you think about your sins. Whether, whether you think they're really sins or not, if they're contrary to the word of God, I ask you, are they sins? Yes. yes. Even though you're, got, you're just a little off. You're still in sin. And so what this is saying to us is, is that repentance is dealing with our sins. It's, it's not crying. It's not saying, I'm sorry. It's repentance. It's changing your direction in life. Now, here's what I really want us to get. Because repentance has gotten such a bad rap and it's such a negative thought here. I want us to, to get this part. See, here's what I want you to hear. Is repentance is beautiful. Repentance is the most beautiful word or one of the most beautiful words in our language. Here's why. Because re repentance speaks of hope. Re repentance has a message of change. Repentance says that every negative bad thing in your life can change for good. Repentance says... It's a door that you can open and walk into and lead a great life. Repentance is beautiful. What is negative about that? But yet when a preacher starts talking about repentance, we build a wall of resistance up to it. It's not negative. It should be something we actually brag about. Something that's going on into our lives and, and happening all the time. Repentance says that life can be better. And it is good preaching, by the way. That's, that's <laughs> Change how you think about your sins, even if you don't think you're that bad. Or even if you don't think that it's really sin. If it's contrary to God's word, we have to recognize it is. And it's causing us bumps in life. It's causing us obstacles in life. It's causing our life to not go smoothly. Now, repent is about hope. You can get rid of the past. It would be horrible to, to live in a world where I couldn't dump my garbage of my past, that I always had to carry it with me forever. But that's what repent says. Repent says, I can dump my past. I can change my life. So repent is one of the most beautiful words that you'll ever hear a preacher talk about. A drug addict can start over again. If he or she repents, an alcoholic can change his or her life if they'll repent. Everything can change. Your marriage can change if you'll repent. How you treat people will change if you repent. Everything about life can get better if you repent. Your work ethics can change if you repent. How you, how you respond to your parents children, young people, you can repent. You can become what you need to be and life can go well with you. Things can absolutely change in every single area of life when we learn to repent. Even how you serve God. Even how you look at God. There's a way out of the destruction of life. There's a way out of the dilemmas that we're all facing if we repent. You don't have to keep going down the road of destruction if you repent. It's a word of hope, and it's something we should brag about, not resist. So I'm asking you not to resist me today, not to resist what God wants you to hear today. And repentance isn't something that happens one time. You're baptized into it. You're whelmed with it. You're emerged in it, submerged into it. Baptizo. 
It's not something that happens once. It's something that should be happening every day. It's not something we come to the altar one time and cry and pray a prayer and, and that's it. That's not what repentance is. So, have you repented? Um, have you? And, and are you? Are you repenting of something right now? And see, this is exactly what John preached about. People weren't repenting. And let me say this, is that you're not fooling anybody when you don't repent. <laughs> uh, you Sometimes we think we're, we're fooling our spouse, or we're fooling our children, or we're fooling our friends, or we're fooling people at work. No, you're not fooling anyone. They know you. <laughs> and they know if you've repented or not, if you've changed the direction of your life, if things are different for you. You're not fooling anyone, and you're certainly not fooling God. Of what do you need to repent? A habit? An addiction? How you treat your spouse? Your finances? How about work ethics? How about gossip? How about anger? Young people, what did you do on that date last night? What did you do when you went out with your buddies? Anything you might need to repent? See, hear me, young folks, if you will take what I'm saying right now and learn how to repent now and learn the importance and the beauty of repentance now, your life is going to be so much better later. Things are going to go smooth for you, straight for you. You're going to meet so many less obstacles, so many less bumps in the road. It's going to go so much better for you if you learn how to repent right now. So, from what sins do any of us and there should be something for all of us. From what sins do any of us need to repent? Now, I'm going to jump. That was verse 3. I'm going to jump to uh, verse 7 and because I want to stay in the context of John's message and what he said. We'll come back and get verse 4, 5, and 6 in just a minute. So let's look at Luke chapter 3, verse 7. John said to the crowds, uh, King James says multitudes, coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Now, let's, uh, let's make sure we don't stay church ease here in Old English. What is a viper? Snake. snake. For those of you who didn't know, you do know. It's a snake. It's a, it's a viper. It's a venomous snake. Uh, you brood of vipers, John said. <laughs> who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? John preached a coming wrath. Verse 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, there is no repentance unless there's fruit. In, in keeping with repentance, there is fruit. There's some proof of it. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't pull the race card on me, John said. <laughs> For I tell you, that out of these stones, God can raise up children from, for Abraham. That doesn't impress God. Verse 9. The axe, the axe. What is the axe? The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit, not wormy fruit, not little bitty fruit, but good fruit, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people said, what should we do then? How'd you like to have John for your pastor? A bunch of snakes! I'm sure he'd say it like I did with a smile on his face, you know, and as he stood here in his superhero outfit and dipping bugs. So I want to deal with what he's saying to, to the Jews in, in a few minutes, and we'll look at that, but, but what I want to look at first is what is God saying to us? What, what, we're going to look at what he's saying directly to the Jews, but what is he saying directly to you and to me today concerning this thought of the baptism of repentance? So, in context, who in context constitutes a brood of vipers? What constitutes a, a brood of vipers? Let me tell you. See, it's inclusive of the Jew, but goes way beyond the Jew. Here's what, here's what the brood of vipers are. 
the brood of snakes, the generation of snakes. Here's, here's what they are. It is legalistic religious people who refuse to repent. Let me say it again. Legalistic religious people who refuse to repent. Hear, hear, hear me. If you refuse to repent in God's eyes, you're a snake. Let me get my camel hair on. I got to find some camel hair. Can't say things like that without a superhero suit on. We play religious games. And this is what John is talking about. You're playing games with God. That's the context of what John's saying here. People who will not repent. And if this is you, then there is always a coming wrath. There's always an axe that's chopping you down. And it is the very thing from which you refuse to repent. That thing will chop you down and that thing will burn you alive. Not repenting cuts down every tree <laughs> that will not produce fruit. The point is this, is this, that there's no obvious fruit in our lives. There is no repentance in our lives and there is no forgiveness of sins. I'm sorry, praying a sinner's prayer does not constitute repentance. It has to have fruit. Name any fruit tree you want. Name it. It has to have fruit. If it just blossoms, if it just has green leaves, it's coming down. And this is the thought here. And repentance is obvious. You're not fooling anybody by saying you're repenting or saying you're a Christian when there is no fruit in your life. Now the people said, okay, John, tell us what to do. Make it clear to us. Don't use, don't use uh, parables. Uh, don't use axes and trees. Uh, make it clear. Make it clear to us. <laughs> so John says, okay, I will. Verse 11, John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. So obviously there is a person who has a lot of stuff and will not share it. You're a greedy person. Uh, you know there's people in need. You're, you're, you see this all over, but you, in greed, refuse to give it. John says, fix that. Fix that. Share what God's blessed you with. Don't be greedy. You're obviously greedy. He goes on. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they ask, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. You're cheating people. You're, you're not straight. You're crooked. Stop cheating them. Take what you're supposed to take, but don't take more. The so and some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Don't manipulate people. Don't shake down people. Don't, don't, don't manipulate people to put pressure on them. Tell them you're going to arrest them if they don't, if they don't give you money. Be straight with people. Be honest with people. Don't be manipulative. Here's the point. Here's the point. It's obvious. It's obvious. It's not that you don't know what you need to repent of or from. You know. It's obvious. And not only do you know, but your family knows. Your people around you know. People at work know. It's obvious. You're not producing fruit. John said, fix the obvious. So what's obviously wrong in your life? It doesn't require a rocket scientist. Just ask your spouse. <laughs> ask your kids. Ask your parents. You know what it is. What's God telling you right now, this moment? I need to work on this. And I'm not saying it's adultery. I'm not saying it's some blatant thing like that. What I'm saying is if it's contrary to the word of God, it's sin. It could be a little one or a big one. You can miss it a little bit or you can miss it a lot. It's still sin. Repent, fix it, produce some good fruits before it cuts you down. 
that axe is whacking at you right now. It's going to bring your life down. It's going to burn you alive. And John said as an outward sign of what's going on inside of you, He's standing, I mean, see it. He's standing in the, in the Jordan River. He says, this is an outward sign of this. He says, I want you to come into the waters, and I'm going to baptize you into repentance. I'm going to whelm you. I'm going to get, emerge you. Baptizo. And multitudes came. <laughs> Crowds came. <laughs> so, with that said, because a lot of people go to church, but with that said, I want to read this to you in a different translation, or actually a different version. How many of you are familiar with the Message Bible? <laughs> it's, a, it's a real neat version. Our, our, it, it's modern language, and it uses language that we would hear and talk today and use today. So let's read that from, from the Message Bible, verses 7 and 8. It says this, When crowds of people came out for baptism because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded. Brood of snakes! What do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to deflect God's judgment? It's your life that must change, not your skin. Don't pull the race card. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there. Children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children from stones if he wants. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes to the fire. How many of you think that John was a little tough on religious ideology, right? Uh, he was a little, little tough. <laughs> See, calling those people a generation of snakes or, or, or a brood of vipers, whatever, him, in calling that, he was, he was telling them a generation of snakes. He's relating them all the way back to the serpent in the garden. He's slapping them in the face. And he's saying, you say that you're children of God, that you're children of Abraham, but in reality, you're really, your father is the devil, which is exactly what Jesus is going to say. A lot of what Jesus says, you hear first, first from John. John had a, an amazing influence on the ministry of Jesus. He said, don't think your descendants, see, in their minds, they could quote, they, they, could, they could quote all the way back, every, every parent that they had all the way back to Abraham, they could do it. And in their minds, because they could do that, that was enough to save them. They were circumcised the eighth day. They were marked with circumcision, mark of the covenant. They were in covenant with God. John said, you're a brood of vipers. They thought that would save them. That wasn't. John says you're playing religious games. You're not fooling anybody. It's not your skin. It's your life. See, they were poisonous people, injecting their false stuff into people and deceiving them, making them twice the sons of hell that they themselves were. That's what Jesus said. Later in the temple, and which is the Old Testament church, later in the temple, Jesus is standing there just days before he would be crucified. He's gone through Matthew chapter 23, and he said eight times, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he comes to verse 33, and he says this, You serpents, this is Jesus, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape what? What, what? The damnation of hell. Why? Because they wouldn't repent. And then just a little bit later, three verses later, he says this, I tell you the truth. All these will come upon this generation. John preached a, a message of the coming wrath of God. So did Jesus. And within one generation, 37 years later, that whole area was laid desolate. That temple in which Jesus stood at that particular moment when he said it was laid desolate. The whole area all over Jordan, all these people that came then to John, all those people that will be coming to Jesus, 100,000 of these seed of Abraham died, were cut down literally with the axe and thrown into the fire. Why? They wouldn't repent. Religious games. No fruit. Here's the point. Religion alone will not save you. Verse 
Religion alone will not forgive you of your sins. There must be repentance. And it's something you can see actually happen in your life. So uh, what is your fruit? Do you come to church because it's the popular thing to do? Because I need to get my kids in church? You do. But don't be playing games. Learn the beauty of repentance. How's your life changed? How many of us are only religious? How many people that claim to be Christians are only religious? No fruit in keeping with repentance. What's your life producing for the kingdom of God? Jesus, just a short time later, a few years later, says this in Mark 1, uh, verse 15. It says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and you and you and you and you. Repent. Why? He says, repent you and believe the gospel. Listen, you really don't believe the gospel if there is no repentance. You're deceived to thinking you're believing, but you really don't believe unless there's fruit. I want to say this. Jesus despised bad legalistic religion. I'm going to work on this. We'll get to chapter 6. We'll really get into it. I'm just going to kind of crack the egg today and just kind of take a, a quick peek at it. But, but Jesus despised that. And, and as we already know and as we're going to be seeing more and more and more, his worst personal enemy was religion, was bad legalistic religion. And here, here's why. I'm, I'm, let me try to explain it to you. See, that's when people love their rules and their traditions more than they love God. The standard for righteousness is not the word of God. The standard for righteousness becomes their rules, their legalisms, and their traditions. And Jesus himself said, listen, your traditions make the word of God of none effect. It's not working in your lives by your rules and by your legalisms. And people think they're saved. It's a false message that it's bringing. And people think they're really saved. Where in truth, you cannot escape the damnation of hell. It's full of judgmental people. Legalistic religion is. It's worthless. It's full of hate, hypocrisy. The people that call others hypocrites are actually hypocrites themselves because they're judging. And, and I'm guilty of this. It's, it's bad. It's worthless religion. Let me show you uh, what James said. Now, we, we see that Jesus said this. We see that John said this. And James is the brother of John, and he wrote a book. And interestingly enough, the book is called James. So let, let's read just a, a passage from, from this. James chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. It says this. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his or her tongue, he deceives him or herself. <laughs> uh, you, you, you getting it? You know, okay, and, and he's about to go into this long talk about the, the tongue. And what he's saying is when, when you're judging and when you're talking about people and when you're gossiping and you're doing this kind of stuff, he said, you're, you, you think you're religious, but you, it, what, what does he say next? His tongue. He deceives himself and his religion is? Is what? Can that be? Can you actually go to church and it just be worthless? Why? Why? Is it simple? This is what the whole message is about. If you ain't got it by now, you haven't repented. He says it's worthless. Religion that God, our Father, accepts is pure. This is pure religion. And faultless religion is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What's, what's he saying here? He says, listen, you got to guard your tongue. you got to bridle your tongue. you got to keep a tight rein on that thing. Not to be judgmental. Not to talk about people. Not to gossip. you gotta, you got to do that. you got to help people. That's how you really show your love for people is by doing something for them. And, and then what this will do is separate you and keep you from being polluted by the world. 
He says, if you really want to know what God's looking for, look at that. So honestly, how are we doing here? How are you doing here? How am I doing here? See, those John addressed thought they were just fine. Thought they were the children of Abraham. And in reality, they were a brood of snakes. Which am I? Which are you? Now, let's jump back to verse 4. See if we can get some relief. Verse 4. <laughs> As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. You get, you get the picture? Make, make things level, make things smooth. Every mountain and hill made low, every obstacle. The, the, the crooked roads shall become straight and the rough ways, the potholes, the rough roads, smooth. And all mankind will then see what? Huh. Now, now, John's called to prepare the way for Jesus. This is what this is about, God's salvation. He's prepared to, to, to prepare this way. So let me read you something from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It says, when a king traveled the desert, workmen preceded him to clear debris and smooth out the roads to make his trip easier, the king's trip. In Luke, the leveling of the land was figurative expression, was a figurative expression, denoting that the way of the Messiah would be made smooth because, through John, a large number of people were now ready to receive Jesus' message. Now, now this is what... This is the analogy, this is the, the figurative expression that the scriptures use. And what John brought was a message of repentance. The message of repentance is supposed to do this in our lives. The message of repentance, when it gets into us and we really repent, it takes out the low places of life, the valleys, the depressions of life. How's things for you? Having a lot of low places? And, and, and it's to bring the high places down low. It's to the mountains, the obstacles in life, those things that, that hinder our progress through life, that, that brings them low. It levels them. The crooked part of our lives, the crookedness that we are, is supposed to straighten it out. That's what repentance does. The bumps in life, the potholes of life are all filled in and smoothed up ahead of us because we repent now. It's smoother later. This is the message that John brought. Now, now, certainly, John was unconventional. Uh, John wasn't politically correct. He wasn't religiously correct. John was eccentric, would you say? But he prepared the way for somebody even more eccentric, even more off the hook, off the chain. For example, let me give you this. Uh, John, as we have talked about, and if I understood the scriptures, this is what it's saying. As we looked at that scripture to start with, John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what John preached. Uh, up until John, people would deal with sins and receive forgiveness and atonement for their sins by taking an animal to the temple and sacrificing this animal. Right? Am I, am I right? That's not what John preached. That's different. John preached, I don't care how many bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer you do, and it's going to work. <laughs> he says, you got to repent. It's all about repentance. It's about getting in this water with me, he said. It's about being baptized into a baptism of repentance. And if I understand, that's exactly what that's saying. John did not undergird or preach temple worship or animal sacrifice. John preached repentance. That's what prepares the way for God to come into your life and to my life and to make things good and smooth and, and life great. <laughs> See, John's outside the proverbial religious box. And we should be too. It's not a sinner's prayer. It's not crying at the altar. All that's good. Nothing's wrong with that. If you want to do it, fine. There they are. But if that's all you do, it's a religious game. And how will you escape the damnation of hell? And you're a snake. <laughs> he 
He said, it's all about repentance, fruit, and baptism of it. And Jesus backed that up. Next week, we're going to have uh, water baptism. And uh, we're going to be talking about the baptism of Jesus. How many think that's pretty important? Uh, if Jesus was baptized, you suppose we ought to be? Okay. If Jesus was baptized in John's baptism, the baptism of repentance, suppose we ought to be? Wait, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Did you just say Jesus needed to repent? Okay, if you're negative about repentance, then no, he didn't. <laughs> but if you see what I'm trying to tell you about repentance, it's a beautiful thing, and it makes things smooth for you ahead, then yeah. I mean, he knows he needed some smooth places in his life. Mm -hmm. Speak to the mountain. Command it to be moved. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. And he came to John's repentance, baptism, to be baptized. That was fascinating to me. And, and what's amazing is that the whole Trinity shows up here. <laughs> you know, here's Jesus in the water with John in, the, in his baptism. And, and the heavens open up. And the Bible says that the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So there's God speaking to people, being water baptized. And then here, here is the Holy Spirit descending out of heaven as a dove. And, and it lights on Jesus and remains... So the whole Trinity is here. He's, the whole Trinity is going to be here next week. And the whole Trinity is going to watch whoever get baptized. <laughs> See, baptism encompasses so much. Uh, and, and, and so let me, let me run through a couple of thoughts here. First thing, that we're, we're, when we talk about baptism, we're talking about being clothed with Christ. Let me read you this. See, we put on Jesus in baptism. Galatians 3.27 says this. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So you're totally immersed, you're totally clothed, you're totally wet with, with the body of Christ, the, the presence of Christ on your life. And baptism also speaks about the, the burial and being resurrected into a new life. And in Romans 6, 4 it says this, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that Jesus, that, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, because of baptism, we too may live a new life. Baptism speaks of circumcision. The Jews got nothing on us. <laughs> circumcision. Covenant. That's what you think of. See, they were circumcised to show their covenant on the eighth day so that it marked them for the rest of their lives a covenant relationship with God. Well, Jesus... We'll baptize, we'll, cut, we'll circumcise some people there next Sunday. Let me, let me read to you. Colossians 2.11 says this. Not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by who? By who? By who? Right. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is important, do you think? But no matter how you look at it, the foundation of baptism is repentance. You're just getting wet if you don't repent. You're playing a game. So how many of us think that maybe uh, we might could use a fresh baptism of repentance? So maybe you ought to ask God about that this week and see what happens. Uh, you know how we do it. I'll talk and preach and then... I'll invite anybody to come up. You forget your towel, you can go home wet. We don't care. Maybe we can find you a towel. But, but you know, it's more important that you get baptized than, and, than it is that you go home dry. So uh, just ask God this week what he might have you do next week. Let's pray. Father, <laughs> your word is amazing. It, of course it is. It's Jesus. It's the word made flesh. And you're speaking to us, Lord, and we just want to get this repentance thing. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just want to ask you something. How's your life? How many low places are you experiencing? How much depression? How many, how many bad things happening in your life? Are you just slow? 
How many, how many high places, how many mountains, obstacles in life are you experiencing? Are you, are you going through right now? How many obstacles and bad things you can't get over them, around them? And when you think you do, it pops up again. How, how's, it, how's the ride? Is it bumpy? A lot of potholes? Just a life of bumps. Can't get up any speed. Get knocked out of alignment. How crooked are they? Yeah, a lot of curves. I, I want to tell you what John the Baptist is telling you today. What, if you were to ask John, what's the problem here? Here's what John would say. Repent. Repent. He'd say, that's your problem. You've got to be baptized in Repentance. Because if you don't, then it's an axe to you. The thing that you refuse to repent of is an axe to you and chops you down and eventually will burn you alive. Repentance isn't bad. Repentance is great. It's beautiful. Repentance is a new start, a fresh start. Repentance is a hope and a future. Repentance is, is dumping the garbage of the past. Repentance is straightening out curves and lives and filling in potholes and making the low places fewer and the high mountains that we can't get around or over less monumental. It makes life smooth and good. So how many of you along with me would say, yeah, you know what, there's some things in my life, at least one thing for certain, that I really need God's help so I can repent. How many of you would say along with me, yeah, there's at least one, Delbert, and raise your hand if that's you. Would you raise your hand right now if I think that's just about all of us. If it's not, I'll pray for the rest of you. But listen, Father, help us. Lord, it's a life of repentance, a baptism of repentance. And Lord, every single one of us, repent you and you and you and you, Jesus told us. It's for every one of us, Father, and I just ask you right now in Jesus' name that you help us. Um, Understand the necessity of repentance so that we're not chopped down and we're not burned alive. Help us. Now, one more thing. My head's still bowed, eyes closed. Um, some of you are far from God, and what you must first repent of is the way you think about Jesus. You, you need to repent. You're not where you need to be with God. You're far from God. And maybe there was a time in your life where you were close to God, but you've slipped back. Or maybe you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you see, until he's Lord, uh, there's going to be always mountains. There's always going to be potholes. There's always going to be valleys. Everything's always crooked. You see, Jesus can straighten that out. You can see God's salvation. You can have a great life. Jesus says, I come to give you life and that more abundantly. And it's through repentance. So if that's you today, you're here and you just know you're not where you need to be with God. And you're saying, man, I want my life straightened out. I want to be where I'm supposed to be with God. That's you. Would you, right where you're sitting, let me identify you when you raise your hand. Raise your hand and let me just point you out and, and see you and let the Lord see you. I see hands all over the place, seven or eight of them, eight or nine maybe. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.